Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you here this morning. Last night, we had a great service. We had the ordination of our youth pastor, Craig Fortin, and it was just well attended, but it was just a great celebration of the body of the church. And, you know, we're going to be continuing in this series, What I Believe, and Roger's going to continue talking about what I believe about the church. But one of the things that we do believe about the church is that Christ is the head of the church, right? And that if we're going to have a vision for what he wants to do, we need to call out to him. This song this morning, 562, Be Thou My Vision, is that reminder to us, that prayer for all of us, right? To ask God to be the vision of our lives and, 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 and the way, the truth, and the life. So let's stand together. Let's join in song together, number 56, 562, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee come thou with me, Lord. How my great father, I thy true son, will Joyful song. Tim, praise him, Jesus, our blessed 
singing this morning and we're going to continue in song. This next song is about wanting to uh, raise the name of Jesus. We want to see Jesus lifted high and in it you have a part in it too. We're going to be clapping three times as we say we want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. All right let's join in together.
See, once is okay. Once is okay. I forgot the mic twice today. Somehow I, I th just think I'm personally wired, I guess. It's good to see you, though. I haven't been up here in a while, so some of you haven't ever seen me, maybe. Uh, my name is Tim Howard. I work here as one of the pastors, and um, it's good to see you. And boy, it's good to see many of you, because it's been like a year since we've seen some of you. Over and every week, we have new people that we say, hey, I haven't been here for a year. So it's good to see you, and it's, it's good to see you. It's people that I have seen here now. Thank you. I am here to pray with you, so please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for being able to be here and worship. It is good to worship and glorify you together, and we thank you for that. Lord, we invite you now to speak into our hearts. We, um, we open them up, God. We, we need you. We want you. We invite you to come in. Lord, we want to be prepared to what you have for us to do and to hear the things you want us to hear, and, and you know how easy it is for us to miss it, so... Lord, help us. We invite you to speak. Lord, we need your comfort. There's many of us in our midst who are hurting, and I pray that you would speak into their hearts, that you would care for them. Lord Jesus, there are people that are, have lost loved ones. Um, Sherry Garnett has lost a brother, and we pray for your peace in that family. Lord, I pray also for the, the Misho family who lost a loved one and ask that you would speak to the people as they go tomorrow, Lord. She, she wanted everyone to, that came to her service to have hope, to know how much hope she had and what a difference it made in her life. And Lord, we pray that each one would have that message of hope. Lord, there's some that need healing, and, um, and we ask for that healing think of Eric today as he is going through some real rigorous treatments down in Boston and ask that you would comfort, heal, help, help him through this. May it go quickly, Lord. Give him peace. Lord, we pray for those who um, need protection. We uh, have many people, loved ones, who are around the world in the armed forces, and we don't want to forget them. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to them. Lord, Justin Dosti especially, Lord, would you speak to his heart right now? May he be blessed today by you. Lord, he went through the loss of a loved one recently too, and it must be especially hard to do that far away, so help him, I pray. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've blessed us, and as we give back to you, we pray that you would use, and that you would help us use every dollar wisely and into your glory and for your kingdom. And we pray for the blessing on the rest of this service, on Roger as he speaks, on each one here, anointing from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian Civic League of Maine is stepping up and doing its part to recruit and train individuals to run for local and state office. They'll be hosting candidate training sessions on July 24th at East Auburn Baptist Church and July 31st at Cross Point Church in Bangor. For more details, email Carol Conley at carol.conley at gmail.com. I'm Jess, and we are so thankful that you could join us this weekend. If you are new to East Auburn or are joining us online, please visit eabc.me slash connect so that we can connect with you. Here's what's happening at East Auburn. Summer camp season is right around the corner. If you are interested in having your child attend a camp this summer, scholarships are available. Please contact the church office for more information. CareNet helps make decisions about unexpected pregnancies. They are collecting donations from Mother's Day through Father's Day. We still have bottles available in the lobby if you are interested. Hospitality is starting back up this weekend. Join us outside under the pavilion for coffee and snacks. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. You can give easily online at eabc.me slash give, on your phone using the EABC app, or you can place your offering in the boxes as you leave the service. 
If you would like prayer, please come to the front of the sanctuary at the end of the service where someone will pray with you. Or you can add your request to the prayer chain by emailing prayer at eabc.me. Our military family is very important to us. We appreciate their service and sacrifice to our country. Please remember to be praying for them. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of the service as we continue the series on what we believe. This next song I'd like to share with you is a song that was written by Steve Emerson. And in this series of what I believe about the church, as Roger's going to be talking, one of the things about the church is it should be a place where people can connect, where people can find love and acceptance. And this song is that reminder to us I'd like to share. Souls on the street addicted to sin Selling themselves to survive Not understanding the hope they could find in a place where God's love is alive. They doubt that they could meet the standards necessary and fear that they'd find judgment rather than a sanctuary. This must be a place where the broken heart can mend. This must be a place where the outcast finds a friend. For we cannot lift the fallen our hand still holds a stone and their sin that seems so great to us is no greater than our own there must be a point where shame meets grace and this must be the place The house looking good, but the home is collapsing within. Pressures of life pull the family apart, and temptations, destruction begins. They doubt the church could have answers necessary and fear they'd find rejection rather than a sanctuary this must be a place where the broken heart can mend and this must be a place where the outcast finds a friend. For we cannot lift the fallen if our hand still holds that stone. And their sin that seems so great to us is no greater than our own. There must be a point where shame meets grace. And the church must be the arms of God reaching out to bring them in to a place where they can find his love regardless of their sin. This must be a place where the broken heart can bend and this 
Amen. Thanks, Mark, for that. And we want, we want our church to be that place. Amen? Amen? By the grace of God, he would help us to be that place where shame meets grace. Because grace met all of us in our place, a place of shame. Amen? Amen. And uh, not only did it maybe years ago for me and for some of you, but every day. Every single day, the grace of God meets us at our place of shame, place of pain, place of human failings, sin that we all struggle with. So we come together, and uh, the great part of the grace of God is he meets us at that place. But remember what Jesus said to the woman that was being judged and the woman that was being condemned, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. He doesn't leave us in that place, but brings us to a new place of opportunity of growth and bringing glory to God, being who we've been created and made to be. We're talking uh, a second week, a second helping about what we believe about the church. The reason we are, we're doing an eight-point series, supposed to be eight sermons, and uh, but last night we for two hundred plus of our fellowship. We were, there was probably 300 here last night, but there's a regular fellowship on Saturday evening that gathers, and we had the ordination service for Pastor Craig, and uh, he was ordained. So, praise the Lord for that, and uh, a great step forward uh, in his, his uh, progression as he continues to grow uh, professionally in his work and ministry, and and um, so we took the whole hour to do that. So we wanted all the services to be at the same place when I preached the last of our series. So we had, I had a lot more to say about the church, so we get to talk about that this morning. So uh, not only what do I believe, it's not what I believe, it's what, what do you believe about the church. We want to move you from church being a, co- a convenience to a conviction. And boy, there's a difference when the church is something you believe that it's biblical and right to be a part of the fellowship of the family of God. And so we're going to talk a little more about that this morning. We do have kids in our service, and uh, during COVID, we've, uh, been cr- it's been great to welcome children to all of our, our services, and they're looking for, they have some special things that they're going to be doing, and the words they're looking for are the words Jesus, church, in gospel this morning. Jesus, church, and gospel. Now this morning we're going to talk about what the church should look like. Uh, Mark just sang a song. I thought it was perfect for our series that the church should be the place where every individual feels a welcome and feels the love of God. And uh, we don't experience that in so many places. And this is a place that Christ's love should be known and talked about, but also experienced. Experienced in big and in small ways. We want people to experience His love. And we're gonna, so we're going to talk a little bit about what the church should look like, and all, we're also going to talk about you know, your part in that. Your part in that. There's a note made uh, in the book of Kings. 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 8. 1 Kings chapter 10 
and verse 8. This is when the queen of Sheba had visited Solomon. That's the title I used to give to my sister Joy. Uh, She was the oldest child in our family, my sister Joy, and she she was like perfect all the time. She made me look really bad because I'm a long ways from perfect. I was always in trouble. And she was treated, though, like the Queen of Sheba. And uh, Mom and Dad, everybody catered to her. And so I remember calling my sister Joy Queen of Sheba. And uh, so we see in this story that the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon. Recently in our staff meeting, there was a a note read or an email or something that was received by, and I don't remember the name of the individual, but the individual wrote into our staff and said, I have never in my life been a part of a church where people are happy. And he said, this is the first church that I've been a part of that people are happy when they come to church. And I thought, how sad that his whole church life was such that people came and they weren't happy. But I was so glad to know that his report about East Auburn was that people, when they came, were happy. They were uh, positive and encouraging and uh, glad to be in church. And uh, we want that. We want people to come. And we want, you know, I haven't met you folks yet, but you came. We sat near each other in worship, and I'm glad you're here. And we want you to feel welcome and know that, you, you know, that this is a, a place of joy and a place of celebration of life and a celebration of of Jesus. And uh, I was so glad that guy's experiencing a happy church. Now, everybody's not happy here all the time. I'm not going to pretend like they are. I'm not always happy. You're not always happy. We all have bad days, and we make mistakes, and we fail one another. But we're thankful for forgiveness. Amen? Um, We're thankful for grace and and, uh, the opportunity to grow in in even the mistakes we made. But here's what the Queen of Sheba said about Solomon's uh, kingdom. He said, happy are your men, and happy are are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you. And so here, the queen of Sheba, when she came to visit Solomon, said, your, your, your servants are happy. The kingdom is happy. Oh, we want the church to be a positive, joyous place that people experience Christ in his love. Now, that doesn't happen by accident. We've all been in places, restaurants, where the, the, you know, the attendants, the, the waiter, the waitress, uh, uh, it doesn't is mad at the manager or the cook or and they're complaining and they're negative and it, it about ruins the meal for you. Well, sometimes when people come to church, it uh, you know the negative pessimism criticism can can ruin the experience. We want we want a joyous place. The Bible says in Ephesians four three that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're going to see this morning that everyone contributes contributes to the church. Everybody contributes uh, to be welcoming and loving and kind to one another. But it takes work and effort on all of our parts. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16 that there, there are some things that God hates. Some things that God hates. It's a It's a holy hatred that God has for some things. Just like he has what's called the righteous wrath. There's some things that make God angry. He's a God that has emotion. And in this text, it says there are six things that the Lord Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Number one, a proud look. Number two, a lying lying tongue. Uh, Then hands that shed innocent blood and a heart that deceives wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run to evil. And 19, verse 19 of Proverbs 6 says, a false witness who speaks lies, and then listen to this one, and the one who sows discord among the brethren. See, the Bible tells us that there is a a unity that we have because of Jesus. He brought us together. In In that unity that we have in Christ, we've been all brought together, 
And uh, uh, we've been made one because of Jesus, but there's still a lot of diversity in the church. Amen? There's young, there's old, there's contemporary, there's traditionalists, there's Democrats and Republicans and independents, Green Party and whatever else there is out there. We have a mix of people that come together, one in Christ. Amen? One in Christ. That's our oneness. There's a lot of things we probably don't agree on. Mainers divide over all kinds of things. Main men divide over Dodge, Ford, GMC. <laughs> they divide over Skidoo, Yamaha, Arctic Cat. Did I hit your favorite sled yet? What, Polar? Oh, yeah. There are Polarises also. They're in the shop getting fixed, but they're, they're, they're all right, so I'm happy for you. See, we divide over those things. But in the church, we come together and we're one in Christ. He brought us together. So we don't look, judge, and criticize, and condemn. God's looking at the inward man, not the outward man. The church was so good at looking at outward things. So were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and he said, you bunch of whitewashed sepulchers. You know what he just said? <laughs> You're like tombstones. Look beautiful on the outside, dead on the inside. That's what Jesus said to those judges and jury of individuals that were critical and condemning of others. He called them whitewashed sepulchers. So... Our, two weeks ago when I taught on the church, here's some of the stuff we learned. Number one, we learned that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. It cost him absolutely everything. We won't go to these texts, but I'll give you the texts again. That was found in Acts 20, 28, where it says he purchased the church with his own blood. Number two, we found out that he loves the church. In Ephesians 5.25, it says, Christ loved the church. And so I wanted you to do a little examination and say, what's your attitude towards the church? And a lot of times it's not what it should be because it's made up. We look at people and they disappoint us. So we get a bad attitude about the church. But if we look at Christ, look at Jesus. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes, your spiritual eyes, fixed on Christ. Then you have hope for the church because it's all about Him. It's not about me. Praise the Lord. Aren't you glad? <laughs> amen. I thought I'd get more amen out of that than that. I know how some of you think. I know you don't like me. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm dumb enough to think everybody does. So, you know, <laughs> I've been, you know, I was a baby of the family. My sister was the firstborn. I was a baby. I thought the world revolved around me and everybody loved me. All right? And I still believe that. Well, we not only learned that Jesus... <laughs> purchase a church with his own blood. He loves it, and he nourishes the church. The Bible tells us that Jesus took it very personally when the church was persecuted. He said to, he said to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? What was he doing? He was persecuting the church, but it affected Jesus. He cares about how we treat one another. It, he takes it personally. That means for you and I to say, wow, I'm not going to do anything rude or mean or inconsiderate because I don't want to offend Jesus. Because when I touch the church, I touch him. Remember the scripture that said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto who, me? In, in Matthew 25 and verse 40. The Bible, we, we learned also that every person that placed their faith in Christ were placed into the body of Christ. In, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, it says that people that believed were baptized into Christ, placed into his church, placed into, became a part of his body. The moment you placed your faith in Christ, you became a member of the universal body of Christ. You became a part of the church, baptized into one body. We found in our teaching that uh, Christ was the head of the church. He leads the church, and he leads it through every individual. He leads it not, just, not through just me or through the elders, but through every individual. He's leading our church to this morning. He's working by the power of the Spirit. He is the head of the church so he works through every individual to move his church. So when the child of God comes into church, they say, I want to be filled 
by the Spirit of God, that I be led by Him. Remember, Jesus said, I'll, I'll come to you by the Spirit. John 14 and John 16, I'll give you the Spirit. I'll come to you by the Spirit. And that's how He comes to every individual, and He works. We also learned that He gave gifts to everyone to minister in the church. Here's Jesus' promise. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. This is what Jesus said. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, here's Jesus, promise, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's, it's uh, I will build, promise, my church possessive, and it would be prevailing that it would move forward. And for 2,000 years, the church has moved forward. But it, there is opposition, he notes it, that, that will not prevail meaning there will be opposition as there is today, and it's going to get greater. <laughs> it, it, things are tightening up. Things are getting tougher. I'm not complaining. I'm simply saying there is, there is adversity in individual lives and in the church corporately. You need to know the squeeze is coming. <laughs> it's on, and we're experiencing it. They will tell us that we can't do things that God has called us to do, and we must do those things things that he's called us to do we won't stop preaching the gospel we won't stop teaching what the word of God teaches the whole counsel of God amen Amen. and those are things that we stand together that we'll do together and the gates of hell will not prevail against it now as we read in scripture if you'll turn with me this text I'd like you to turn in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 every believer Every believer, every individual that places their faith in Christ becomes a part of the family of God. And you have been brought close. You've been brought close together. And um, I, you've, you are what, what the Bible calls connected now to the body of Christ. You're connected. You've been brought into a fellowship, into a family. You're no longer on the outside. You're now on the inside. In Ephesians 2.19, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Every individual that places their faith in Christ is a part of the church. And we've been brought together. And uh, here it says we're no longer strangers or foreigners. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation 2,000 years ago by the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This is how sure the church is. This is how stable it is. The foundation's been laid, and now the superstructure is being built. The superstructure is made of you and made of me. For 2,000 years, the spiritual building has been being built, made up of individuals around the world In verse 21, look what it says about you and about me. In whom the whole building is being fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Now let me just say that this is an architectural metaphor that's talking about the inner sanctuary. Literally, when the church is built, and we believe that not only has the universal church been built for 2,000 years, but the local church is being built right here this morning he built this church made up of people the church is not building blocks but made up of people and last night he built his church 8.30 this morning he built his church 9.45 this morning he's built his church and again at 11.15 he'll build this local church made up of people and he brings us together by the power of the Spirit. And here it says, in whom the whole building fit together. And you know what the word fit together in the Greek is? Legos. Kind of interesting. <laughs> like Legos. Everybody who has kids knows what Legos are. Right? They drive you nuts. They don't vacuum up well. They don't feel good when you step on them in the morning <laughs> at all. They cause you to want to say bad words. Sometimes we do. 
Jesus, forgive me. But they're Legos. It's like a Lego. And every one's not necessarily the same size as the same color. He's building his church. For 215 years, he's been building East Auburn. It's a long history. He brought us together. He brings us together. He holds us together. It's all about him. By, all, by him, all things consist. I don't hold it together. You don't hold it together. Uh, the deacons, elders don't hold it together. He holds it together. This building which he is building grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Here's the sacredness of the gathering. It becomes the holy of holies. So when we come together, because there's kind of a cat, we have a casual spirit, because I'm not dressed in a suit this morning. There's still a work within the church, a group that would like me to get back to the tie. I don't want to wear the tie. But I will if I have to. But it's summer. Kind of. Soon. But he brings us together, but this is a sacred temple, the Holy of Holies. What happens in the Holy of Holies is unique. It's the visitation of, that's where God visited in the Holy of Holies. So when we come together, he builds us, brings us together, it becomes a holy temple. It's a sacred gathering. Have that sense of, of holiness and respect for the gathering of the church that he built and he brings together. All right. In whom, verse 22, the whole in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit where God would definitely demonstrate his presence. Now, seeing we're so close according to the teaching of scripture, what keeps us from not connecting? I have a few suggestions quickly this morning uh, that we want to put up. Connected spiritually, we're, we're in Christ together, but we don't feel close. It's like a husband and wife. Barb and I have been married 40 years during those years, we've certainly had times where we were married, same last name, both had our wedding rings on yet. Uh, back when you used to have a home, a, a landline, telephone, one telephone, we had the same telephone number, same address, same last name. And we were married, but we were not connecting. Sat at the same table, we didn't talk. Can you believe that? Same thing happens in the church. We're, we're connected, but not close. Why? Here's some reasons. Some people feel dislocated. They're part of the body. They're in the church. But you all know what it's like to have a, something in your body that's dislocated. When you dislocate it, it's painful, and it's not connected the way it should be relate, uh, in relationship to the other parts of the body. That happens in the church. <laughs> Dislocation. And during that time when you feel dislocated, it might be, you know, uh, you are positionally connected but relationally distant. It might be because of the size of the church and the complexity of the church. It might be because of sin in your life, which certainly affects your relationship with Christ, doesn't separate you from Him. Nothing because of His love can separate you from Him, but you're not, you're not connecting, you're not close the intimacy's not there. Same thing in, in the church relationship. Your sin affects how you connect with the body and how the body connects with you. So you might be dislocated. Secondly, you might feel disenfranchised. This is individuals that don't feel respected, don't, don't feel loved, don't have, they, others don't see them as God sees them. It might be how they, are, how they are, see others and how others see them. This is spoken of in Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 14 that we won't look at this morning, but he says, don't judge and don't despise others. Careful when you're disenfranchising another person that Jesus loved and died for. Amen? Amen. Don't disenfranchise others. Distracted. Remember Mary and Martha? They were both in the presence of Jesus. Mary was enjoying Jesus. Martha was not. Some are just too distracted. Too distracted. Some of them, priorities are out of order. 
They've, uh, as uh, Revelation uh, 3 and verse 4 says, you've left your first love. You don't, you're not in love with Christ anymore. So it's affecting your, your view of the church. And then lastly, discouraged. Being discouraged. And Hebrews 12.12 12 and says, you know, um, if you're discouraged and down, it says, uh, you know, be encouraged. Get, get the encouragement you need. Um, but, you know, get some counsel. Um, get some advice. Spend some time with others in prayer. Get encouraged and then pick yourself up and uh, be in a place where you can connect close with the body again. Now, the last, uh, the last 10 minutes of our sermon this morning, and we're back to an hour. You might not have known that. And some of you go, oh, I only gave for a 40-minute service. I need to give for a, a 60-minute. The baskets will be out back. When you leave, you can give that extra cash that you were planning on giving. But we're going a full 60 minutes with our services now. And so I have 10 more minutes to teach. Some of you go, oh, and some of you go, yay, all right. So this morning, though, we're going to talk about God's institutions. The church is one of God's institutions, something that he instituted. And uh, here are some of the things that we see in the Bible. Maybe business is the only one that you might question, but these are things that God instituted, God started. And when God does what God does, we find that with each of his institution, there are three things. There's structure, there's order, and there's authority. There's structure, there's order, and there's authority. And this morning we're going to look a little bit, it's important, and this is teaching by the way, but the teaching is to move you to conviction. Because some people once again come to church because it's convenient, but then trust me, it's not going to be convenient long. There'll be many inconveniences if you get close to the church, and so you'll quit coming. And so I want to move you from a convenience to a conviction that you believe the church is, in fact, God's plan, and it's a non-negotiable, it's a necessary part of the hel- a healthy Christian's life. The church is. And it's important for you, and it's important for others. You're important to others, and the church should be important to you. So when God makes it, made the institution of the family, he built it with structure, order, and authority. And uh, when he built a government, instituted government, which is both in the Old Testament and New Testament, talks about government, it, it had structure, order, and authority. When he built his church, it had structure, order, and authority. And um, God is a God of order. When you look at how he created the universe, God is a God of order. And uh, when you look at the human body, you can see that he made it. Some of us are a little more disorderly than others, but relative order, organization to the physical body. So the spiritual organism, the church, has order and organization and authority. Those three things are necessary for an institution to be what God intended to be. And I believe the church should have Order. The Bible talks about order in Titus 1, verse 5. In Titus 1, 5, Paul says this, For this reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So here we see in this very verse that there is these things are noted. Order and authority is right here. I'm going to, I want you to set certain things in order. The church was not intended to be a, just a chaotic spiritual organism that just kind of free-flowing, and if it happens, it happens, and if it's good, it's good. Most of the time, that, that kind of thing doesn't happen long. It's not good very long. It needs order and authority. Appoint elders in every city as I command you. Now let me just say authority is kind of a bad word today. No one wants authority. But the Bible talks about there's authority in the family unit. Did you know that? The Bible talks about that? That the husband is the head of the the home? He's supposed to lead, yeah, lead like Jesus led and gave himself for it. Some of the husbands were nudging their wives like, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. Did you hear the pastor? Well, you need to do it like Jesus did it. And he sacrificed himself completely for the church. So when you're loving and leading in that way, your wife will have absolutely no problem following after a sacrificial leader. But the Bible also says 
that the husband and wife are to submit to one another. I'll just throw that verse out. You say, I don't believe that. Well, read Ephesians 5, and I believe it's verse 21, where it says, submitting yourselves to one another. Okay, that's where it begins. So um, here, when Paul was establishing the church in Crete, he wanted Timothy, or Titus here, to set in order the things that were lacking in the church and appoint elders in the church. So this is a part of God's plan that he would set things in order. In 1 Corinthians 14, 40, Paul says, let all things be done decently and in order. So how did Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. So we're going to see this morning that he had a plan for building his church. And um, let's uh, look at the text. This is one of the major outlines that we've been looking at, the building of the church by Christ. And we're going to see how his followers fulfilled that. The building of the church, looking at Acts chapter 2, and if you'll turn to Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, we're going to see that the gospel is preached, people believe and were baptized, and it's going to say they were added to the church. Gospel preach, the good news. God loves you and loves me. Amen? Amen. So much that he sent his son Jesus that, that your sins would be forgiven from his sacrifice. He pays the price through faith in him, receiving him. You become a child of God, part of the family of God. Now, I want to I look at the outline right now for a few moments. And uh, so the gospel is going to be given. Then we're going to see that as a result of the gospel... People believe and were baptized, Acts, Acts 2, and looking at it, particularly uh, looking at verses uh, uh, 39, 40, 41. And then we're going to see that they gathered. They didn't just believe and were baptized, and that's the end of the story. That's the beginning. Then they become part of the family, part of the fellowship, and they come together. And when they come together, certain things happen. There's a plan, and they study the Word. The scripture says, and it says they fellowship, koinonia, share life with each other. That's why after our service this morning, the pavilion will be open and we have our, our hospitality center open again because we can, we can be hospitable and gather together outside freely and we're glad to do that. And uh, so food and fellowship often go together, especially in a Baptist church, Amen. That's the way it's always been. That's part of our historical uh, thing. But we gather, we connect with each other. And let me just say, it's not just others connecting with you, it's you connecting with others. And then there's a giving, a sharing, and it's not talking about money necessarily. It's talking about you being willing to give yourself to meet the needs of others, whatever their need is. And then it tells us, from that came growth. Now let's read the text. Acts 2, 40, and with many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. I say that to you this morning. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must have a spiritual life. Each of you that are here have a physical life, and now you need a spiritual life. And through faith in Christ, you can begin, you can be born again, as Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Here Peter said, you must be saved. In verse 41, then those who gladly received his word, they believed what Peter said, they received it, and they were baptized And that day there was 3,000 souls added to them. The gospel must continue to be preached. Amen? We want to give the gospel. And we want to build believers up so they're living and giving the gospel also. We believe that the gospel is not just given in church, in gatherings, but you live and give the gospel. You live the life of Christ. You love like he loved. The church has somewhere become a spectator sport, people come together, they spectate and they watch, they give scores, pastor I give you a seven, this week you got about a three and a half out of ten, you know we hope you go back to eights or nines preacher, I'll give a little more if you do, spectating, watching, but the church used to be a participation of everyone, living and giving the gospel, 
and the church was multiplying, and it was, and it's still supposed to be today, and we're thankful that it is. Here it says, and 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42, this is where they gathered. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, teaching, and fellowship, koinonia, and breaking of bread, communion, the agape feast, and in prayers. We do all those things. We want to keep doing those things. This is, why do we do what we're doing right now? It's a rare thing where hundreds of people come together on a Sunday morning and sit and listen. Well, the teaching of the apostles' doctrine has been taking place all the way back to Jesus, all the way back into the Old Testament, teachers there, and certainly in the New Testament, we see that there were teachers and pastors, such as what I'm doing and what you're doing this morning. This is an ancient practice by the church because it had order in organization, certain things that took place. Apostles' doctrine, the church should continue to preach and teach the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, koinonia, we connect with one another, breaking bread, remembering Jesus, and prayers, which we've done here this morning. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Whatever is mine is yours. Whatever is yours is mine. Whoever drove in with that vet this morning, I would like to claim that, by the way. (laughs) Seeing we believe that, amen? Good, I can't wait. You can have my old Newport, okay? It runs, not real fast, but it works, and I'll give it to you. Now all who believed, some of you are nervous now. That laughter was like, (laughs) like, oh boy. Okay, Then then fear came. All who believed were together. They had all things in common. So there was the gospel preached, gathering, the giving, and what happened? Growth. Look what it says. Verse 46. So they continued daily. This fellowship was gathering in the large group, but also daily in small groups. Connecting. Caring for one another. Can't do it with everybody, but everybody should do it with someone. Have friends, you've got to show yourself what the scripture says. Friendly. Friendly. And if everywhere you go, you don't get along with anybody, the common denominator in that story is you. Maybe you need to ask someone why. They might simply say, you have bad breath, B.O., and you're mean. (laughs) Wow, three things you can change right now. Boom. (laughs) Brush your teeth, put on some deodorant, and start being nice. There you go. Pastor helped some of you this morning. Okay. (laughs) I've been wanting to tell you that for a long time. So, (laughs) they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Verse 47, growth. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Do you see this happy gathering of fellowship, love? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He could entrust others to this fellowship because of the way that they were treating each other. God does the work of salvation, amen? Amen. He does the work. We're part of it. He uses us as tools and instruments, but we can't save anybody. He brings salvation, but he can entrust new, new believers, babes in Christ, to a family that is safe and healthy. Lord, help us to be what we're supposed to be to one another. And to the glory of God, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me note the altars are open. Um, We welcome you up front. There will be those that will pray with you this morning if you'd like to. Also, if you come to church this morning and don't have a Bible, we have brand new Bibles, not like the Pew Bible, which is all worn out and broken. We have brand new Bibles. No obligation. We won't take your number, your phone, phone number, your address or any charges, but we'd like to give away the Word of God. And so if you don't have Scripture, we have a nice text we'd love to give out to you uh, following the service. God bless you. you. You get to dismiss yourself this morning. You can head to the Hospitality Center, and um, I hope you have a great week. Thank you.